is Kenneth Gowie. I am currently a postdoctoral researcher at Ghent University in Belgium, working on 15th century Arabic historiography. I received my PhD from the University of St Andrews in 2016 for a thesis on the development of jihad ideology in 12th century Syria. My thesis has been expanded and was published last year by Brill under the title Reinventing Jihad, Jihad Ideology from the Conquest of Jerusalem to the End of the Ayyubids. The research project which culminated in this book was inspired by the observation that, whilst jihad underwent a revival in the 12th and 13th centuries, modern scholarship has focused more on the revival of the practice of jihad than on the ideology of jihad. There are two reasons why this is the case. Firstly, there is the meaning of jihad itself. The narrative of the revival of jihad in the 12th and 13th centuries draws heavily on the dominant paradigm for understanding jihad, which is based on the opinions and writings of the scholarly classes and which is usually referred to as the juristic discourse. This discourse presents jihad as an essentially stable idea, which was best encapsulated by Emil Tayan in the Encyclopedia of Islam. He says, in law, according to general doctrine and in historical tradition, the jihad consists of military action with the object of the expansion of Islam and, if need be, of its defence, end quote. Taking this understanding as its basis, modern scholarship has generally considered the issue of jihad in the 12th and 13th centuries settled. The second reason is that whilst we are well furnished for evidence for the revival of the practice of jihad, ranging from the reports of sermons promoting jihad, the texts of which do not always survive, through accounts of military victories, to the poetry and the monuments which celebrated those victories, such sources are not always well suited for revealing much about the ideology of jihad which motivated its performance. Which is to say, we have only a very vague idea of what jihad meant when contemporaries referred to it and evoked its spirit. The objective of my research was thus to address how the ideology of jihad of the 12th and 13th centuries compared to earlier understandings of jihad. To do so, I focused primarily on three surviving texts from the period. The Book of Jihad of Abul Hassan Sulami, the 40 Hadiths for inciting jihad of Ibn Sakr, and the regulations of jihad and its merits of Izadina Sulami. I asked how these works fitted into the broader discourse of jihad as it developed both within and out with the juristic discourse, from the early Islamic period through to the beginning of the 12th century and then to the end of the Ayyubid dynasty in circa 1249. I chose these works because they represent understandings of jihad ideology at the beginning, middle and end of the period. They therefore facilitate a diachronic examination of how contemporary perceptions of jihad developed in response to the ebb and flow of 12th and 13th century history. My analysis progressed by asking what these three scholars meant when they referred to jihad, how their perceptions of jihad related to the broader Islamic discourse on jihad, and how their perceptions of jihad related to each other's perceptions. My book is not, of course, the first study of what 12th and 13th century Muslims meant when they used the term jihad, but it is the first to contextualise their use of the term against the broader discourse of jihad. As I've already mentioned, modern study of jihad in the 12th and 13th centuries has been dominated by the juristic discourse of jihad. This model arose from modern study of legal texts and corpora, which were focused on the regulation of jihad beneath the authority of the caliphs. It predominates in modern scholarship and acts as a yardstick against which all discussions of jihad are, me are measured. The problem is, however, that the juristic discourse is fundamentally the master narrative of jihad. It's hardly surprising that studies of jihad in the 12th and 13th centuries take it as their basis, for the corpus of scholarly literature devoted to the juristic discourse is vast and well established. But as I demonstrate in my book, it was not the only expression of jihad which had developed by the turn of the 12th century. Alongside of it, and in reaction to it, counter-narratives developed and evolved. My book outlines two such counter-narratives, which arose in the geographical and intellectual frontiers of the Islamic world. The frontier discourse of jihad presented in such works as the Book of Jihad of the 8th century ascetic Ibn al-Mubarak, and the Sufi discourse of spiritual jihad, as espoused by figures like al-Khazal. The frontier discourse understood jihad as an inherently personal religious act, uninterested in questions of authority or concerns of state, in which the individual believer demonstrates his devotion to God by volunteering not merely to fight for God, but to die for God. Accordingly, this discourse stresses the merit of performing jihad, the importance of right intention and the merit of martyrdom. <laughs> 
The Sufi discourse, whilst likewise expressing a personal understanding of jihad, held that the highest form of jihad was to strive against one's baser instincts. Described as mujahada, the purpose of this jihad was to conquer the base desires of human nature and to attain thereby a heightened understanding of God and a superabundance of reward in the hereafter. These counter-narratives of jihad were not excised from Islamic thought by the dominance of the juristic discourse, alongside which they coexisted, and I argue that they should not therefore be excised from discussions of jihad in the 12th and 13th centuries. Ignoring them and relying instead upon the juristic discourse of jihad has the unfortunate effect of limiting discussions of jihad by making it easy to essentialize it by suppressing differences between the socio-political contexts in which the term has been used. Integrating these discourses into the study of jihad in the 12th and 13th centuries, however, has ramifications not just for the meaning of jihad in this period, but in how we understand the history of this period itself. Let me explain. When discussing Muslim responses to the Franks in the 12th and 13th centuries, the dominant model for understanding them is, no, is most commonly described as the counter-crusade, or the anti-Frankish jihad. This model holds that the 12th century witnessed the gradual but inexorable revival of jihad from the tentative steps of the first half of the century through to the reconquest of Jerusalem in 1187. This process occurred in lockstep with both the unification of, of Syria and Egypt under first Nur ad and then Saladin and the deployment of a propaganda apparatus designed to identify Jerusalem as the ultimate goal of the counter crusade. Implicit within this model, is the idea that the 12th century was a period of near permanent confrontation between the Muslims and the Franks. In the context of this model, the 13th, the 13th century sits somewhat awkwardly, with the actions of Saladin's successors, particularly the treaties and concessions made with the Franks, being portrayed as a betrayal of the jihad fervor and the ideals which had developed during the 12th century. While this model is being increasingly challenged, and a more nuanced picture of Christian-Muslim relations and of resistance to the Franks is emerging, it nevertheless remains at the heart of discussion of jihad in the 12th and 13th centuries. The effects of this centrality are far-reaching. Take, for example, Abul Hassan Salami and his Book of Jihad. Due to the significant time lag between his death and the revival in jihad enthusiasm, Asulami's Book of Jihad is regarded as both precocious in his description of the arrival of the First Crusade and, ultimately, unimportant for the revival of Jihad. His Book of Jihad is seen as representing an intellectual cul-de-sac, interesting for, for what it reveals about Muslim reactions to the First Crusade, but nevertheless still a curious and almost anachronistic anomaly. The central issue of his text, Jihad, is overlooked in favour of his understanding of the origins of crusading and his motivational strategies. Contrarily, the upsurge in jihad enthusiasm in the reign of Nur ad-Din has had the opposite effect on Ibn al-Sakr and his understanding of jihad. The model assumes that something must have changed to account for the intensification of jihad in the second half of the 12th century, where previous scholarship suggested that this was due to the dedication of the political elite to jihad. More recent scholarship has described Ibn Sakr as placing jihad ideology on a new trajectory, which facilitated the intensification of jihad in the second half of the century and beyond. As for the 13th century, witnessing as it did a de-intensification of jihad on the part of the Ayyubids, the issue of jihad ideology is set aside. Attention instead turns to the issue of why the Ayyubids failed to live up to the example of Saladin, with the implication being that they represent a departure from what had become paradigmatic, namely the continuous prosecution of jihad against the Franks. The first half of the 13th century appears then as an uncomfortable hiccup in the grand narrative of the Counter Crusade, which only culminated later under the Mamluks. Now, if we move away from both the model of the Counter Crusade and its teleological narrative, and away from the discourse of jihad and its predominance, the development of jihad ideology in the 12th and 13th centuries becomes more complex, more nuanced, and ultimately perhaps more reflective of the historical reality. Consequently, I argue that the 12th and 13th centuries emerges a period wherein scholars continuously wove together different discourses of jihad in attempts to encourage their rulers and their co-religionists to fight against the Franks. Abul Hassan Sulami, rather than following the standard jihad ideology of his time, 
was actively engaging with it and seeking to amend those aspects which he thought stood in the way of a successful jihad against the Franks. Thus, in the absence of interested leadership, he argued that the significance of the First Crusade had made jihad an individual obligation and drew upon the Sufi discourse to underscore the importance of the individual believer and, perhaps more importantly, the individual believer's right intention to the success of jihad. He makes a more significant break by integrating eschatology, framing the reconquest of Jerusalem as the first stage in the resumption of the Islamic conquests, which would culminate with the conquest of Constantinople and the realisation of the eschaton. Jerusalem's reconquest becomes a part of a jihad which was enjoined in perpetuity by the Prophet upon a group of Syrian Muslims. Yet this focus on the individual differs from the focus placed on the individual by the frontier discourse of jihad and the Sufi discourse. For Abu Hassan Sulami, jihad is primarily about establishing this worldly ascendancy for the Muslim community as a precursor to the eschaton, not about demonstra demonstrating the individual's devotion to God, whether that be through martial or spiritual jihad. That Abu Hassan Sulami's book of jihad did not encourage his co-religionists to take part in jihad against the Franks does not diminish the originality or importance of his attempt to reinvent jihad for the political situation at the beginning of the 12th century, for by doing so he created an entirely new understanding of jihad. Likewise, when discussed against this broader canvas, the break which Ibn Asakr made with the jihad ideology of previous centuries is neither as stark nor novel as had been suggested. Whilst Ibn Asakr did streamline the juristic discourse of jihad, the resulting ideology was inspired by the example of Ibn al-Mubarak. Yet this was not simply the replication of Ibn al-Mubarak's uh, frontier jihad, but its consolidation within the juristic discourse and its subordination to the importance of the ruler's authority and the necessary integration of the jihad warrior into the Muslim community at large. Ultimately, jihad in the 40 hadith is beholden to neither the juristic discourse nor the frontier discourse of jihad. Ibn Isakr's un understanding of jihad is, like Abu Lassana Sulami's, designed to respond to a particular context. It is for this reason, then, that Abu Lassana Sulami's emphasis on the individual and on the eschatological is not reflected in the 40 hadiths. Both were redundant because Ibn Isakr wrote at the behest of a powerful ruler who had united much of Syria beneath himself. Looking into the first half of the 13th century, my discussion of Isadina Sulami suggests there was likewise no qualitative break between the 12th and 13th centuries. Insofar as jihad ideology was concerned, the process of reinvention continued unabated. While Ibn Sakr undoubtedly represented a significant voice in subsequent jihad ideology, his understanding of jihad did not become paradigmatic. Thus, Isadina Sulami's understanding of jihad while similar in many regards to Ibn Asakr's, marks a fundamental disjunction precisely because he reintegrates juristic material. This did not represent a refutation of Ibn Asakr, but rather an, an alternative approach, which sought to mobilise the potential of the juristic material as a means of criticising contemporary society's approach to jihad. Similarly, while Abul Hassan Sulami and Isadina Sulami's understanding of jihad were both rooted in the juristic discourse, they engaged with it differently and generated different understandings of jihad. Likewise, Isadina Sulami's use of eschatology in a related text, the exhortation to the people of Islam to reside in Asham, is fundamentally different from the use made of it by Abul Hassan Sulami. While both scholars used eschatology in their attempts to inspire jihad, only Abul Hassan Sulami used it to modify jihad. These scholars all drew upon the same body of material, but interwove them in different ways. The reinvention of jihad was not an iterative process working towards a new and fundamental jihad ideology, but rather a process of flux and reflux, which was inherently relative to the changing socio-political contexts. Study of jihad ideology in the first half of the 13th century, um, part, particularly its increasingly critical bent, recalls the dynamic of the first half of the 12th century, wherein Abu Lassana Sulami criticised the inaction of rulers and sought to obviate their importance. While Isadina Sulami did not seek to remove the ruler from jihad, it suggests that the difference between the second half of the 12th and the first half of the 13th centuries was not necessarily one of jihad fervour, but rather one of political authority.
Muslims engage with Franks throughout the 12th century, even during periods of jihad. Figures, as, uh, figures such as Nuruddin Sal- and Saladin, like the Ayyubids who came after, both made alliances and treaties with the ostensible enemy. In this context, then, the real politic of the first half of the 13th century, rather than being an aberration, had more in common with the first half of the 12th century. It is the second half of the 12th century, wherein Nuruddin and Saladin were able to exert and maintain personal control, which sits uneasily within the broader socio-political context. My book is significant, therefore, not simply because it provides a more nuanced reading of jihad ideology in the 12th and 13th centuries, but for how it changes our understanding of the history of the period by further questioning the validity of the model of the counter-crusade. Contextualising the works of Abul Hassan Asulami, Ibn Sakir, and Izzadin Asulami within a broader discourse of jihad indicates that whilst the basic parameters of the model of the counter-crusade remain unchallenged for the practice of jihad in the 12th and 13th centuries, they are inadequate in the context of the ideology of jihad. The practice of jihad did increase over the course of the 12th century before declining in the first half of the 13th, but detailed study of the works of these three scholars highlights how important it is to disengage the political dimension of the revival of jihad from its ideological dimensions. The overwhelming weight of the former necessarily distorts our understanding of the latter. These works indicate that there is no delay between the arrival of the Franks and attempts to modify jihad ideology, and that this urge to modify jihad was continuous and reflexive. The 12th and 13th centuries were not merely a period of the revival of jihad, but a period of the reinvention of jihad.